love and hatred for the sake of Allah. You have to love for the sake of Allah and you hate for the sake of Allah. The ones you love are, is the muhmin, the believer. This is who you love and you hate the kuffar, those who disagree with the Islamic Akita, the Islamic creed. So yes, when you're in a state where you have to live among the uh, non-believers, non like you live in America or the UK, you can't just go around you know, knocking people to the side of the road like uh, Mohammed told you to. No, you're in a, weak, a state of weakness, so you have to be friendly, you have to smile, you have to have chit-chat and conversation, but deep down inside you have to have hatred in your heart, or you are not a good Muslim. So we have confirmation here, we have confirmation from a Muslim. Now, Sam, go ahead and continue. Yeah, with in fact, he just said something, that if you're a true Muslim, you're supposed to hate disbelievers for the sake of Allah and love the believers. Obviously, he's making that up, right? Of course, he's a liar, you kafir. You're a liar, dude. In fact, the Quran says you're najis, you're unclean. But you know what? You've been purified in the holy blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. So the Lord Jesus lives. May he be magnified. Uh, you're supposed to hate disbelievers for the sake of Allah and his messenger. Don't just say Allah. Allah and his messenger. <laughs> Without mentioning Muhammad, Islam is incomplete. And you're supposed to love the believers for the sake of Allah and his messenger. Let me just give a few Quranic verses to confirm what he just said. Lest the people say, no, he's lying. That's not what Islam teaches. Okay. Chapter 9 of the Quran. Surah Al-Tawbah. Chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. And by the way, Chapter 9 is one of the last, if not the last, chapters that Muhammad composed before he died. In other words, these are his final marching orders, his final instructions to the Ummah. So these are not verses at the beginning that were abrogated later. These are verses that came at the end of his life, and this is what he says. <clears throat> o you who believe, take not for awliya, meaning friends, your fathers and your brothers, if they prefer disbelief to belief. Whoever of you does so, then he is one of the zalimun, wrongdoers. Notice, if your fathers, my dad, my brother, are non-Muslims, and they prefer to be non-Muslims than Muslims, I am not to befriend them. Verse 24 says, say, if your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your wives, your kindred, the wealth that you have gained, the commerce in which you fear a decline, and the dwellings in which you delight, are dearer to you than Allah and His Messenger, and striving hard and fighting in his cause, i.e. jihad, then wait until Allah brings about his decision, and Allah guides not the people are al-fasiqun, the rebellious disobedient to Allah. So this passage clearly says, if you love anyone, even if it's your mom or dad, more than Allah and his messenger, and you love them more than jihad, doing jihad against them, that's the context. Uh, how am I going to do jihad against my family members? Come on, that can't be, they're my family members. The Quran says, if you love them more than jihad, striving against them, to subjugate them to the rule of Allah and His Messenger, then you are no better than them, and Allah will torment you on the Day of Judgment. Mm. Right? And there are other verses, but I think for the sake of time, should I just stop there? Um, yeah, and we can, we can always come back to some more passages uh, later on. Uh, now, by the way, we know that uh, lots of you out there, especially Muslims, especially Muslims who grew up in the West, will want to disagree with us. No, that can't <laughs> be what Islam teaches that's not what my Muslim friends taught me. That's not what they taught in my mosque. Well, we're not saying that's what they taught you or that's what you heard from your Muslim friends. We're saying this is what Muhammad taught. This is what the Quran teaches. This is what you find in the Hadith and from the companions of Muhammad. This is exactly what Islam teaches. So you have this doctrine of taqiyya. You're not supposed to be friendly towards unbelievers, but you can deceive them into believing that Islam is peaceful and, and believing that Islam is friendly and believing that Islam has no, uh, no goal of subjugating anyone. You can deceive them into thinking that. Now, Islam is an inherently political religion. So when we start having uh, Muslim politicians here in the United States, uh, we might wonder, are they going to start implementing taqiyya in order to deceive us about the intentions uh, of their religion, of Islam. Well, it's always possible, of course, we want to clarify this, uh, it's always possible that uh, someone like Representative Keith Ellison just doesn't know what Islam teaches, maybe he hasn't studied it very carefully, uh, maybe he grew up in a very liberal Muslim environment where uh, Islam was watered down. That's always a possibility. So when we say taqiyya here, uh, we're going to assume that Keith Ellison, who is defending Islam, actually knows about his religion. And watch what happens. I mean, think about the importance of having hearings on the radicalization of, uh, of Muslims. That's a very important topic. We've heard terrorist attack after terrorist attack after terrorist attack. 
um, thousands upon thousands of terrorist attacks since 9-11, not to mention the past 1,400 years. People want to know, why is this happening? And so we have hearings, and Representative Keith Ellison has the opportunity to testify in order to give his input. And his input consisted, for the most part, of trying to deflect attention away from Islam. And we're going to look at a video clip now. We're going to see uh, the sorts of tactics Representative Ellison was willing to engage in in order to keep our attention off the fundamental question of why are so many Muslims turning to violence uh, around the world. Let's go to our first video clip. Let me close with a true story, but remember that it's only one of many American stories that could be told. Mohammed Salman Hamdani was a 23-year-old paramedic, a New York City police cadet, and Muslim American. He was one of those brave uh, first responders who tragically lost his life in 9-11 attacks almost a decade ago. As the New York Times eulogized, he wanted to be seen as an all-American kid. He wore number 79 on the high school football team at Bayside, Queens, where he lived. He was called out by his friends. He became a research assistant at the Rockefeller University and drove an ambulance part-time. One Christmas, he sang Handel's Messiah in Queens. He saw all of the Star Wars movies. And it's well known that his new Honda was the one that read with the young Jedi license plates. Mr. Amdani bravely sacrificed his life to try to help others on 9-11. After the tragedy, some people tried to smear his character solely because of his Islamic faith. Some people spread false rumors and speculated that he was in league with the attackers because he was a Muslim. But it was only when his remains were identified that these lies were exposed. Mohammed Salman Hamdani was a fellow American who gave his life for other Americans. His life should not be identified as just a member of an ethnic group or just a member of a religion, but as an American who gave everything for his fellow Americans. Are you back? Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman for his testimony. Mr. Chairman. Wow. Um, a member of Congress uh, reading about a Muslim who died on September 11th and can barely get through it because he's crying. Uh, just to clarify, just to clarify uh, what happened historically, um, you had Muslims who died uh, on September 11th. You had Muslim rescue workers who died uh, on September 11th. Um, but think about what's actually going on here. And, and j uh, just to clarify the situation even further, um, you did have a situation where some people thought, hey, this Muslim came up missing on September 11th, and these buildings were destroyed on September 11th. We know about all these other Muslims who were involved. Some people were suspicious that this Muslim, who goes by Sal, uh, that Sal was involved. He's a Muslim. He came up missing during the terrorist attacks. Maybe he's involved. Uh, the vast majority of uh, media uh, afterwards responded hailing this man as a hero. They had an idea that he went there uh, as a rescue worker. And so this man is being hailed as a hero. You had some uh, skeptics along the way. Um, but think about this situation. You had 3,000 Americans die, killed in the name of Islam by Muslims yelling Allahu Akbar. I don't see Representative Ellison crying for those 3,000 non-Muslims. I see him crying for the one person that uh, people looked at and said, hey, maybe this guy, he's a Muslim. We know that the terrorist attacks were carried out in the name of Islam. Maybe this guy had something to do with it. He's crying his eyes out on behalf of this man. Now, what's going on there, my friends? Uh, what's going on? Because think about this, because we see this over and over and over again. Muslims carry out a series of terrorist attacks, 
and people say, hey, we need to look at Islam. We need to open up the Quran. We need to open up the Hadith and see, is this what Islam really teaches? They don't claim to have the answers ahead of time. We're going to open up the Muslim sources. We're going to have testimony, and we're going to find out if that's what Islam teaches. And Muslims almost universally say, no, don't do it. Don't open those sources. Don't open up that Quran. Don't you dare investigate Islam. Now, why would this be, my friends? I mean, think about this. Imagine, you, you Christians out there, imagine the, the situation were different. Suppose a series of Christian terrorist attacks started springing up around the world. And you had Christian terrorist attacks across Europe, Christian terrorist attacks across America, Christian attacks, uh, I mean, Christian terrorist attacks across South America, everywhere. Christians start, start killing in the name of Jesus. They're specifically declaring, we are killing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And someone said, suppose someone said, hey, we need to go to the Bible and look at the passages these Christians are quoting to see if this, what, this is what Christianity actually teaches. Would you be against that? Sam, would you be against that? No, I'd, I'd say, go ahead. Uh, what Read would we about say? Jesus. We would, say, we would be, the, the, one, we would be the ones calling for hearings. We would be the ones saying, let's all get together. Let's have this out. Let's open up the Bible. Amen. Let's look at what Jesus taught, and we will see whether these people are misrepresenting and hijacking our religion. We would be the first people calling the gospel. for hearings. Name, amen. That's what we would do. But Muslims, again, almost universally, don't look into our religion. What are you worried that we're going to find? If Islam is really a religion of peace, if the Quran is really filled with peaceful teachings of Muhammad, why wouldn't you say, yes, let's get together and we will expose the teachings uh, of those who misrepresent our religion. But that's not what you see. That's not what you see. It seems, when I see people like uh, Representative Ellison, doing everything he can to veer our attention away, it seems like they've got something to hide. It seems like they're trying to deflect our attention because notice what they do. We say there are some people carrying out terrorist attacks in the name of Islam. Why don't we open up the Muslim sources to see if they're getting this from the Quran? And if not, then we'll know. But we have to look to see. And every single time, organizations like CARE, Keith Ellison, ISNA, they say, if you open up the Muslim sources, you're automatically condemning all Muslims and saying that all Muslims are terrorists. And so to refute your claim that all Muslims are violent terrorists who are trying to destroy America, I'll point out a peaceful, kind, good American Muslim to refute you. Well, I hate to break this to you. I've never met a person who says all Muslims are terrorists. I've never met a person who says that every Muslim is out to destroy America. Almost every person I meet even the critics of Islam will say the majority of Muslims are peaceful, the majority of Muslims aren't trying to hurt anyone, but there is always a minority of Muslims who are intent on following the teachings of the Quran which command them to fight the unbelievers. That's our claim. We agree that it's a minority. But we also say that, it's, that, that they're inspired by the teachings of the Quran. Does that mean every Muslim follows them? No. I mean, does every Christian in the world follow Jesus' te command to love everyone, including their enemies? No. I'd say most Christians do a pretty horrible job of following Jesus' teachings to love everyone. So there's a, there's a difference here. There's a difference between what the religion teaches and how people act upon it. The question is, the people who carry out violence in the name of Islam, are they getting it from the Muslim sources we say yes. What do you guys think? Definitely. Yeah. Uh, do you want to say something? Good, brother. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, two votes at the same time. Yeah, so. <laughs> We're unanimous you to... then. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you... definitely. Like I said earlier, this is a fundamental aspect of being a true Muslim. Like you said, now everyone may not know that. Everyone may not believe it. But when you go to the source text, you have to have what I heard a uh, Saudi preacher say, positive hatred for the kuffar. This is something you have to have. It, as it was explained to me, I was given the example of Ibrahim, Abraham. Oh, yeah. Abraham, explain. he was a man of monotheism. His father was a kafir, a polytheist. His people were polytheists. In order to fulfill his mission and call in life, he had to have hatred for his father and hatred for his people. So this is the example that's given inside the mosque, inside the lessons at the mosque that you have to have hatred for the kuffar. As a Muslim, I lived in America, but I really wasn't an American. This really wasn't my country. I didn't have any allegiance to the president or to the flag or to the constitution because these are all disbelieving things. This is not, this is not based on Tawheed. 
You cannot have allegiance to something that's not based upon the Tawheed. In fact, uh, Dave, on the point he just said about that you're supposed to hit all of the disbelievers, and Abraham is set forth as an example in the Quran. Uh, I actually want to show what a modern Muslim website, it is a renowned authoritative Muslim website specifically for those who are Salafis. And our brother here was a Salafi until the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ delivered him out of the lies and deceptions of this false religion. Uh, Sam, before you, before you go on, um, if you were a Muslim, what brand of Islam would you subscribe to? Uh, <laughs> Salafi Islam. And I would, if I yeah. were a Muslim, because we study, we, 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 don't, yeah. we, don't, we don't study Islam based on what people say about it. We study Islam based on what Muhammad yes. taught about it. Yes. And as far as we're concerned, the Salafis have the right idea going back to the earliest uh, Muslim sources Precisely. going back to the companions getting your views about Islam from there rather than much later when Islam has been changed and altered and adapted in various circumstances so go ahead and by the way this website I want every Christian to go to this website start researching some of their uh, fatwas uh, meaning their religious comments opinions <clears throat> instructions it's www.islam the letters QA dot com www.islam QA dot com because here they're not just quoting any Joe Schmo. They're qu quoting the leading Salafi Muslim scholars, many of whom are from Saudi Arabia itself. So it's quoting the top Salafi Muslim scholars. In fact, brother, do you have something to say about this website before I even quote the reference? What, as a Salafi, what is your view of this website? Used to be, as a former Salafi who now is watching the blood of Jesus. Uh, Sahih. Sahih. Yeah, so it's, it's sound. <laughs> it's sound. It's authentic. Yeah. These are the top scholars. So if you're, if you're going to be a true Muslim, you have to be a Salafi. And if you're going to be a Salafi, you have to read these sources. Now, most Muslims, fortunately, are not Salafis. But that's not because the religion uh, causes them not to be Salafis. It's because either they don't want to accept what the religion teaches or they're ignorant of it. However, here's their... Fatwa, their opinion about befriending disbelievers, uh, the kuffar. This is question number 59879. You can actually do a search. Put in question number 59879. Notice the question. Someone's asking them the question, wants the opinion of the scholars. What is meant by taking the kuffar as friends? Ruling on mixing with the kuffar. Let me read this. And again, I'm sorry I'm taking somewhat time, but this is important because it confirms what the brother says. That anyone who knows Islam must hate the disbelievers. <clears throat> this verse explains all the verses quoted above, which forbid, and it's talking about chapter 3, verse 28 of the Quran, which forbid taking the kafirs as friends in general terms. What that refers to in, is in cases where one has a choice, but in cases of fear and taqiyya, it is permissible to make friends with them. Notice, in cases where a fear, and you have to use concealment, it is permissible to make friends with them, as much as is essential to protect oneself against their evil. Let me skip to the relevant part. Sheikh Muhammad al Sali al Uthaymeen. Mm. Who is al Uthaymeen? Sheikh Muhammad al Sali al Uthaymeen. When he was alive, he was probably the second most important scholar in Saudi Arabia. Now, notice his religious verdict. Was asked about the ruling on mixing with the kuffar and treating them kindly, hoping that they will become Muslim. He replied, Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, the Muslim is obliged to hate the enemies of Allah and to disavow them because this is the way of the messengers and their followers. Based on this, it is not permissible for a Muslim to feel any love in his heart towards the enemies of Allah who are in fact his enemies too. Meaning, a Muslim cannot love a true devout Christian like David, and I pray I'm a true devout Christian by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, or like my brother here, because we love Jesus Christ enough to speak the truth that He is the only way. He's the Son of God who died on our cross, therefore, died on the cross for our sins. Therefore, Islam must be false because it contra contradicts the truth of the gospel. So therefore, we are enemies. So you must hate us if you're a true Muslim. But if a Muslim treats them with kindness and gentleness in the hope, that they will become Muslim and will believe, there is nothing wrong with that. Notice, the only time a Muslim should befriend you is if his intention is to convert you and there's a chance to convert you. There's nothing wrong with that because it comes under the heading of opening their hearts to Islam. But if he despairs of them becoming Muslim, then he should treat them accordingly. Hmm. You got it. All right. Well, those of you who think we're wrong, we invite you to call in later in the program. Right now, we have to go to a break. We're going to come back and look at a couple more video clips from our friend 
Representative Keith Ellison. See you in a moment. Welcome back to Jesus or Muhammad. We have a lot more to discuss and we have some more video clips to watch. Uh, but we've noticed that a couple times we've kept, um, we've kept callers waiting uh, too long and then it reaches the end of the show and then maybe they didn't get to ask the question that they wanted uh, to ask. So we're going to go ahead and take callers as they come in. Uh, who do we have on the line? John? We have John on the line? Hello. 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 This Hi, is John. John Sherrill and Angie from Lincoln Park, Michigan. Go wireless. Hey, John. Hey, what's up, doing? man? Hey, how John. John, do yourself uh, do a favor. Turn off your uh, because when you're calling in and watching, we can hear the background. So turn off your uh, sound, the TV. Turn it off so we can hear you. Yeah. Can you guys hear me better now? Yes. Yeah. Great. Hey, what's up, John? Oh, wait. Okay, let me move away from the computer, and then you, uh, then you can hear me better. All right. Okay. okay, can you hear me now, Stan? Yes, yeah, we hey, can hear up? you by the grace of the Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, yeah, Maria. Thank you. God bless you. Uh, I love your program. love what you guys are doing. I have two questions for you. Yes, we love you too, brother. Go ahead. We want, I want to know about the Quran where it quotes the 72 virgins in heaven, oh, what yeah. deeds they're in. Yeah. And I have one other question for you. Sure. Uh, I need to address that, and I want you to address about the miraculous miracle that Prophet Muhammad did, which was split the moon. Can you touch base on oh, yeah. that for me, too? What do you want to take, Dave? You want, mm -hmm. What do you want me to do for you? Want uh, to go ahead and start on whatever you want, and I'll, okay. <laughs> I'll touch right. on the other stuff. And then the brother, you can also, we want you to share, too. Let me just real quickly talk about the, the 72 virgins. Number one, John, the Quran nowhere limits the number of hoodies or virgins to 72. There are traditions that say that each believer will be given 70 virgins. However, it doesn't say only 70. There's a narration which some deem to be weak. However, the Quran seems to support it that says they'll actually be given up to 70,000. But let me give you a verse from the Quran. Let me give you a verse from the Quran that describes what it's going to be like when Muslim men arrive into paradise and find these virgins that Allah specially created for them to enjoy for all eternity. Now, John, I'm going to read this for you. It comes from chapter 78 of the Quran, chapter 78, verses 31 to 35. And I have a lot more verses that I can go through. And if you need more, let me know. I'll give you that. But chapter 78, verses 31 to 35. And John, again, unfortunately, many of the English translations done by Muslims obscure and hide the Arabic. Obscure and hide the Arabic. This is why I'm going to encourage you, either get someone who knows Arabic to confirm what I'm about to say, or go read the Muslim expositors that will tell you what these words mean. Let me read it. Chapter 78, verses 31 to 35. Surely for the God-fearing awaits a place of security, gardens and vineyards. And John, now notice this, verse 33. And maidens with swelling breasts, kawa'ib, swelling breasts, like of age, and a cup overflowing. Therein they shall hear no idle talk, no cry of lies. So here the Quran says, awaiting Muslim men are virgins, maidens beautiful, whose breasts swell and do not sag. Go to tafsir.com, www.tafsir.com, tafsir.com. Read Ibn Kathir's explanation of this passage. He says that their breasts are round, they don't sag, they are firm. This is the description of the Quran. Now I can give you other passages, however... What I want you to do, John, is con contrast what Muhammad said about paradise. You're going to have these maidens with, maidens with swelling breasts, so you can have sex with for all eternity, with what the Lord Jesus Christ says about paradise. Luke chapter 20, verses 34 to 36. Luke chapter 20, verses 34 to 36. Does Jesus believe people will engage in sexual intercourse in the age to come? In heaven? or when he comes down on earth to dwell in the midst of his people. Luke 20, verses 34 to 36. Jesus replied, The people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die, for they are like the angels, they are the children of God, God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. So, John, Jesus says the Quran is wrong. Muhammad is wrong. 
There are no maidens with swelling breasts waiting for you in paradise so that you can deflower and have sex with for all eternity. Jesus says that the Quran here is lying to you. And whose word will you take? The one who left the tomb empty and has been raised never to die again, the Lord Jesus, or a prophet who's been dead for over 1,400 years? Why, well, I think to ask the question is to answer it. Now, Brother David or CL, did you want to talk about the uh, moon? Uh, I, was, I, was, I was typing something up. Did you quote... Did you give them where the 72 comes from? From the Hadiths. Okay. You give that? Yes, I okay. mentioned Hadith. Right. Now, what about this moon split, Dave? Well, <laughs> this is actually this is a, this is an interesting one, and it, it's very common. And it, it's, it's obvious why it's a concern to Muslims around the world today. Uh, in Christianity, we have the most miraculous person in history. We have Jesus, who had a miraculous birth who lived the most miraculous life in history, raising the dead, walking on water, feeding thousands of people with a couple of loaves. He lived the most miraculous life in history. And then, to top it all off, rose from the dead. Now, in Islam, it's well known, when Muhammad came to people, he admitted that he couldn't perform miracles with the exception of the Quran. Exactly. The, That's Quran, the Quran is the only miracle claimed to have been performed by Muhammad. And those of you Muslims who say, no, he uh, squirted water from his fingertips, he split the moon, he did all these signs and wonders, you're contradicting the Quran. Here's what we have. Let me quote the Quran for you. Um, <clears throat> there are, by the way, there are tons of passages like this from the Quran. I'll just read a couple so you don't think that we're making this up. And so you Muslims who believe that uh, Muhammad performed miracles uh, will realize you're not dealing with us here. You're not trying to convince us. You need to convince your Quran. Surah 6, verse 37, and they say, why has not a sign been sent down to him from his Lord? Say, surely Allah is able to send down a sign, but most of them do not know. Well, Allah could send a sign if he wanted, but, you know, might not want to. Surah 10, 20, and they say, why is not a sign sent to him from his Lord? Say, the unseen is only for Allah, therefore wait, surely I too uh, with you am of those who wait. Surah 11, verse 12. Then it may be that you will give up uh, a part of what is revealed to you and your breasts will become straightened by it because they say, why has not a treasure been sent down upon him or an angel come with him? You are only a warner and Allah is custodian uh, over all things. So why isn't Muhammad coming with miracles? He's only a warner. Uh, that's exactly what we find throughout the rest of the Quran. Surah 13 verse 7. And those who disbelieve say, why has not a sign been sent down upon him from his Lord? You are only a warner, and there is a guide for every people. 1327, and those who disbelieve say, Why is not a sign sent down upon him by his Lord? Say, surely Allah makes him who will go astray and guides to himself those who turn to him. Surah 1759, and then we'll go on to discuss this particular miracle. Surah 1759, and nothing could have hindered us that we should send signs except that the ancients rejected them. So, uh, nothing stopping us from sending signs, but the ancients rejected them, and so there's really no point. We know that people aren't but going to follow signs. That, that doesn't make sense if, Ma, if Allah sent down signs, right? If he had sent down signs, it wouldn't make sense for him to say, nothing stopped us from giving you signs, mm -hmm. except they rejected them. But wait, mm -hmm. you already did send down signs. Mm -hmm. Doesn't this assume that he definitely did not do miracles? Because nothing stopped us from giving you miracles, mm -hmm. except mm -hmm. the ancients rejected it. Well, that would make absolutely no sense if he did give him miracles now, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So that's what I'm saying. So how do Muslims so old, contradict yeah. Quran? So older and over and over and over again, the Quran declares, and not just these passages, many more, that Muhammad's miracle is the Quran. Muhammad is only a warner. If you want to look to something miraculous, you look to the Quran. That's the miracle offered. You know what you never see in the Quran? You never see. They ask you why you haven't been sent with a sign. Tell them, what do you mean? I performed a bunch the other day. Exactly. <laughs> you never see that. You yeah, never see that, but that's what you exactly. should see. I mean, you open up the Bible, turn anywhere, you see miracles being performed by the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Quran, over and over and over again, denies that Muhammad was sent with miracles apart from the Quran. Now, interesting question, when do you start getting miracle reports? Well, at about 125, you start having some miracle reports in Ibn Asak, 125 years after the death of Muhammad. And then, as, as time goes on, the Muslim sources start containing, amazingly, more and more, more and more miracle stories. Now, this is very different from Christianity, our, our earliest gospel is the Gospel of Mark, and it's full of miracles. Exactly. It's full of miracles. It's our earliest source. In Islam... 
you have the Quran, your earliest source, tells us Muhammad didn't perform any miracles, and then 125 years later, Muhammad suddenly starts performing some, and then 250 years after the time of Muhammad, you suddenly start getting lots and lots of miracle stories. Well, what's going on here, ladies and gentlemen? What's going on here? I, I think it's obvious. Uh, Muslims got the Quran, they accepted Islam, and then they went out and they ran into Christians and Jews. This was even happening during the time of the Quran. That's why you have over and over again people are asking, where's this miracle? Where's this miracle? Where's this miracle? Well, Muslim preachers actually went out and had to uh, invite people to Islam, but they'd go to, they'd go to Jews and they'd go to Christians and they'd say, believe in Islam. And Christians would say, what are you talking about? We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who rose from the dead, claimed to be divine. Why should we believe in your revelation over our revelation? The Muslims say, because of this lovely book. Look, it's got lovely Arabic calligraphy in it. Uh, <laughs> it must be the infallible word of God. That's much more amazing than walking on water or or raising the dead, isn't it? And Christians said, uh, no, not at all. How is, that, how is that miraculous at all? And so Muslims go out, and over and over again they confront Jews. Over and over again they confront Christians. And every time these Jews and Christians are saying, what are you talking about? We have Moses parting the Red Sea. We have Jesus rising from the dead. Where's Muhammad's miracle? A book? That's the best you can do? And suddenly, miracle reports start springing up all over the Muslim world. But again, it starts at 125 years after the time of Muhammad. So I think on, on, if, if, if we're examining this on a historical basis, when your earliest source says no miracles and it's sources that come from more than a century later and start saying miracles, uh, from a historical basis, um, as non-Muslims, we'd have to be extremely suspicious of this. That's what we as non-Muslims would say. But you as Muslims, you have to deal with the Quran, which says repeatedly, consistently, over and over again, never any exception, Muhammad did not perform miracles. You want to add Can something? I, yeah, I just want to give a verse to confirm what you said. Several times you said that the Quran says the Quran is sufficient. Here's a passage to add to your list, and I'm sure it's there already. Surah 29, verses 50 to 51. If this passage is true, Muhammad could have no, done no miracles. And if he did, then this passage is false. Here it is. Surah 29, chapter 29. Verses 50 to 51. They say, why have signs not been sent down upon him from his Lord? Say the signs are only with God, Allah, and I'm only a plain warner. Now notice 51, Dave. What, is it not sufficient for them that we've sent down upon them, upon thee, the book that is recited to them? Notice it's saying, this book, isn't that sufficient for you? In other words, you don't need any other signs. The Quran is sufficient. However, if Muslims keep insisting that Muhammad had to do miracles in addition to the Quran, that means the Quran is wrong. It wasn't sufficient. You see the dilemma. Understand the dilemma. John, and I want everyone listening, notice the dilemma. If the Quran is right, here is the response Muhammad gives to the disbelievers. What? Is it not sufficient for them that we've sent down upon thee the book that is recited to them? Man, this Quran is sufficient. More than enough. You don't need any other miracles. If you keep insisting that in addition to the, to the Quran, Muhammad did miracles, then you're falsifying the claim of your own book saying it's not sufficient, therefore it is a lie, it is wrong. So you can't even have your cake and eat it too. If he did miracles, the Quran is wrong, right? And it's not sufficient. But if you believe the Quran, then Muhammad did no miracles, and the Quran itself is not a miracle. And we can discuss that in a future session. And, uh, it's full of errors and mistakes and so forth and so on. I, I'll add one, one point. Uh, notice that if the moon had split in half, if the moon had split in half, Sam, isn't it true that people all over the place would have seen this? Of course. Now, now, that's Headline. a different thing. When Major Jesus, news. let's say, walks on water, the only people who are going to be able to report this miraculous event are people who are around him walking on the water. And so that would be people like the apostles. They're the ones who saw it. They'd be the only ones there uh, to record this event. If Muhammad commanded that the moon split in half, people everywhere on that side of would the have planet have seen it, yeah. would have seen it. You have people all over the planet back then who were interested in astrology, in recording amazing events in the heavens. Uh, we have instances, if something happened with a star, there's a supernova or a comet came, people recorded it because they were interested in these. They thought it had something to do with the divine. And so if, if something like the moon splitting in half and then coming back together had happened, we'd expect to hear it all over the place. Strangely, we don't hear about it except for in the Muslim sources, which totally contradict what we find in the Quran. You know what's ironic about that, David? Hmm. You just brought to my recollection, and I challenge the viewers to go find this on YouTube. 
you'll find Ahmad Didat mockingly uh, attacking the Gospel of Matthew, just mocking it, saying, Matthew says that when Jesus died, tombs were broken open, the bodies were, uh, were laid bare, and then on that first resurrection, the bodies entered the, the, the city, the holy city, and showed themselves to many. Matthew 27, 52 to 53. You can go watch what Ahmad Didat says. Uh, the Lord loosened my tongue. He says, man, this would have been worldwide news. Tombs breaking open, bodies coming to life, entering. All man, this would be worldwide news. Everyone would hear about it. Well, now who's laughing? If the moon was splint, then that would have been worldwide news. Everyone would have seen it in that hemisphere, right? And they would have been talking about it. We, ha we have absolutely no single record apart from the traditions, which were written 200 years after the death of Muhammad, about a so-called moon split. Mm -hmm. And so as far as the historical method is concerned, this goes back to... Um, to the principle of things like the principle of embarrassment, things like enemy attestation, enemy testimony. Um, the historian, when he's confronted with evidence, has to be skeptical, especially of things like miracle claims. Uh, if your followers are going to invent something about you, they're probably going to invent something good. They're going yeah. to invent a miracle story. Uh, so that's, that's the sort of thing, that's the sort of thing that a, uh, a historian is going to look at with skepticism. Okay, we know Muslims were in situations where they were embarrassed, where they were being challenged by Christians and Jews to come up with uh, miracles from Muhammad. Is it surprising that some of them eventually started coming up with miracle stories? No, that's exactly what we would expect. That happens everywhere. Um, that, that happens in Christianity. We have all kinds of miracles all over the place uh, in our earliest sources, but later on people invented extra miracles, uh, just, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a fun thing to do. For instance, Jesus giving life to clay birds, things that <laughs> ultimately ended up in the yeah. Quran. Interestingly yeah. enough, we know these stories were invented. Uh, but what we do, think about this. If we have a story in the second century saying that Jesus gave life to clay birds, I don't believe that happened. Why? It's in the second century. It's too far away from the events. And I wonder, why didn't the earlier writers mention this? And so it's possible that Jesus gave life to some clay birds. That, that's always possible. Um, but I have to look at that with extreme skepticism. I go to the earliest sources to see what really happened. And I don't, know of a, I don't know of a Christian who goes outside of the sources within the first couple decades of the life of Jesus for miracle claims. We go to early sources. You Muslims, you don't have any early sources talking about Muhammad's miracle claims. You're early, you're, the sources Muslims actually go to, because we, 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 there are some miracle claims in Ibn Asak, but Muslims don't like Ibn Asak because that's your earliest source, and it says some really nasty stuff about Muhammad. Interestingly, that's the sort of stuff historians look at and say, this must be true. What? You got a story about Muhammad delivering revelations from the devil? Principle of embarrassment, there's no way that Muhammad's followers would have invented this story because it's so harmful to their cause. It must be true. The only justification for having that in their sources is that it's true. Whereas if you start inventing miracle claims, we can see why Muslims would invent miracle claims. So there is so much harmful material. So, I mean, Ibn Asak is one of the bloodiest books ever written about Muhammad's battles and fights and raping women and stuff like that. Uh, Muslims don't like to go there. So what's the, most, what's the most popular Muslim source on the life of Muhammad? Sahih al-Bukhari, more than two centuries after the lifetime of Muhammad. Sam, can, can you imagine Christians appealing to a third century work? to talk about the life of Jesus Christ, Muslims would laugh us out of court. Everyone would laugh Precisely. us. Atheists would be laughing at us. You're going to a, a third century source? What are you, what are you ridiculous? Yes, exactly. Muslims yeah. criticize us for going to sources 20 and 30 years after the life of Jesus. Yeah, they, 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 they were not sources. eyewitnesses, even though they wrote in the de yeah. generation, first generation of the witnesses. And yet Muslims, after condemning our, our scriptures and saying 20 years after the events, that's unreliable. <laughs> Um, or, or how about the creed in 1 Corinthians, which was written within two years of Jesus' death and resurrection? You, that, that's, no, that's too bald, late. Man. Two Come years, you can't, tr you can't trust yeah, something two years Come after. On, and then Muslims appeal to works written more than two centuries after the events that totally contradict what the Quran clearly says and tell us about a miracle of Muhammad. Wow. Amazing. That's something, Dave, um, unfortunately, in the Muslim community, a lot of people accept real crazy stories. Mm. Really? You think? <laughs> you think? <laughs> yes. Think? Hard to believe, but for real. <laughs> but a very popular um, idea floating around the uh, Muslim community is that based on some pictures of Apollo 10, where you see oh. on like a deep gorge kind of inside the moon, <laughs> they say that the Apollo, when they sent the Apollo mission up there, they, they found proof that the moon had really been split, but they're hiding it. 
Oh, so, so people wouldn't know that this miracle actually took place. Yeah. Well, yeah, interestingly, amazing, right? there, there, there was a, a large meteorite that cracked the moon at some point. Unfortunately, it was long before the time of Muhammad. Precisely. Um, yeah, you do find some amazing stories. Though. I, I didn't uh, Neil Armstrong convert to Islam when he's on the oh, moon? Oh, yeah, that too, right? That too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ask Neil Armstrong. Never happened. Uh, exactly. Interesting stuff. And an amazing kafirs landed on the moon before the true believers of Allah did, reciting Genesis 1-1? No, come on. Islam is the fountain of science and learning. Right. They must have been taught by Muslims to... Uh, yeah, Go for we corrupt Catholics. All right, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we hope that helps, John. Uh, if you have other questions, uh, please call back. But I understand we have several callers already. So, again, we do have some, uh, some extra video clips and some extra uh, quotations from Muhammad uh, to go to. But let's go ahead and uh, take a couple of callers here. Uh, Jabari, we have Jabari on the line. Uh, hello, David. Um, hey, Jabari, how are you? I'm the one who's fan. not from Lebanon. Yeah. No, I'm not from Lebanon. That's what I said. Um, You're not. I got California. it right. <laughs> okay. I'm not from California. So, um, David, you said that many Christians these days um, uh, feel horribly in our Savior's com in the risen Lord of Glory's command to love everyone. That's, mm -hmm. that's not very good in our record. And I'd like to know what make, kind of makes you say that. Also, another thing. Keith, what Keith Ellison is doing is like is in is in accordance to Surah three twenty eight and what Ibn Kazir says on that smiling in our faces while cursing us in our hearts. Yeah, that's what we just read here. Yeah. yeah, and it reminds me of John eight forty four where where our Savior says that says that you are of your, of your father the devil devil and the devil's father of lies. And I think I want to say is like in like there is a there is a, a hadith where it says that Al, a Satan is on Allah's throne, and it and uh, and it says it's possible, possible that, that Allah is probably Satan in disguise, which is not surprising since Satan is a liar, is a lot. Allah is the greatest deceiver in his, in Islam, and uh, and, because, and possibly since Keith Ellison believes that Allah is a deceiver, he said. He probably think it's okay for him to him to go on to see the unbelievers as well. That's all I have. To say. Thank you. Um, thank so, you so much, Jabari. Um, thank you so much. Lord bless you. Uh, I, some of the things that in here. What did he say about Satan? On Allah, did he say Allah saying? Uh, he was he was bringing up uh, uh, about Satan being a deceiver, and I think Allah being a deceiver. And did he say something about Satan on someone's throne? I anyway, I didn't hear that. But part. what did he say about Jesus saying, "Love everyone"? Uh, the, the, the question there was, why would I say that I think most Christians fail to live oh, up yeah. to Jesus' standard? Well, uh, Jabari, if you think otherwise, uh, yeah. we're going to have to disagree. You have tens of millions of people in the United States who would claim to be committed Christians. You have many more who would claim to be Christian of, of some kind. Um, I mean, just think. Just think about the example uh, set by Jesus that you love so much that you're, you're willing to lay down your life for them. Um, you do see that, you do see that, but it seems to be very, very, very uh, rare, especially in the West. Christians lots of times um, are, are more worried about, um, you know, about getting a good job and having a nice house and having a nice retirement plan and not saying you shouldn't worry about those, uh, but getting the priorities in order, uh, serving God and helping others, those are the two greatest commands, the two greatest commands. Uh, love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two greatest commands. And um, if anyone wants to try and convince me otherwise, the Christians are actually living up uh, to that example of self-sacrifice that we have in Jesus and that we're commanded to follow. Um, you're welcome to call in. Well, in fact, I, I, if, I, if I were to be honest with myself and honest before the Lord Jesus Christ, who knows my heart better than myself, I can honestly say I don't love people the way I should. Me too. And I don't say that. Yeah, we are, but yeah, 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 we're not saying all of you Christians out there are bad. That's not what we're saying. No, no. We're saying Christians we're saying none in general, of us do. including us. Yeah, well, none do of us do. Yeah. And I praise the Lord Jesus Christ for his grace and mercy uh, that there's forgiveness and that there's strength and power from the Holy Spirit so that the more I fellowship with Jesus, the more I walk with Jesus, the more I love the Lord Jesus, the more I obey the Lord Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm transformed to be more like Jesus. So that although I'm not loving people the way I should, I trust in his power, his grace, his mercy, his spirit, I will love people more and more, love them more than myself, and love myself less than I do. And so that's the work of the Holy Spirit. So I don't think any Christian would have an objection to what you said. 
If we're going to be honest with ourselves and examine our own hearts when no one's watching us and think about some of the feelings we have and some of the thoughts that run in our minds towards our enemies, we can honestly say we do not love our enemies the way we're supposed to and we do not love our neighbors the way we should. But in Jesus' name, by his power, we will. So I just want to say that. Amen. All right. Uh, thanks, Jabari. Uh, I believe we have Manu next on the line, our good Muslim friend. Manu, Manu. Manu. Hello. Hey, Manu. 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 Hey, buddy. Manu. 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 Uh, um, regarding chapter 3, um, verse 28, the, um, it seems like a lot of the translations are heavily influenced by commentary. Um, there's no dispute beginning of the verse, but, you know, that don't take the... Um, the, the believers should not take the unbelievers as um, as Uliya. The end of the verse also there is no um, dispute. It says uh, that God cautions you of Himself, and toward God is the the return. But the only part that's really the dispute in translation that I've seen <clears throat> in a number of translations, including one I have from Saudi Arabia, is that the uh, the Arabic says Allah and Tatta woman from Tawatan which really the and if you go if you want to really see a concise place in the Quran that the word and versus the word in one means that which or that one means if and i've seen i've seen in a lot of translations that they translate this part of this verse as if they if you fear then you can do but however the the actual word tatagu the fear doesn't even capture the full meaning of it. Um, for example, if you go to chapter um, 28, 31, and 32, the word used for fear, when Moses tells God, I fear, he says, um, uh, God tells him, La tachaf, don't fear. And he says that, Eni uh, achafa, I believe. He says the, the word used for fear is actually chaf. The word actually used for tatagu uh, which the root word, it can also, the person who has that quality is a part of the muttaqun in, in Arabic. So what I'm trying to say is that even in like chapter 5, 112, Jesus tells the apostles, attaqullah means the, the very uh, basic um, translation they translate as fear, but it really doesn't capture fear. It doesn't say fear God. It's almost like a sense of having having put a barrier and have been having an um, like avoidance so you would know the consequence of. So in light of those, you can see that the passage really says, God says, except that you would meaning having that quality of avoidance and awareness of between putting a barrier between yourself and them. So I believe a lot of the translations are insufficient when it comes to translating this passage. That okay, uh, like Manu, you, uh, it almost sounds like you're pronouncing the word tattabu. You mean tattaku, right? Yes. Okay, minhum min tukatan. Okay. Now, can you read Surah Anisa chapter 4, 4, verse 1, where you see the same word that comes from the same root? Chapter 4, verse 1, Surah Anisa. Chapter 4, four verse 1. Verses 1. Okay, are you ready? I'm going to read it to you. Go ahead. Okay, O mankind, it says, fear your Lord, right, who created you, and the wombs, right? Okay. And the wombs. So you are to fear Allah and the wombs. How do you, how do you fear the wombs? Because it comes from the same root, ittaqu. Right here, it's ittaqu. So you are to ittaqu Allah and the wombs. How do you fear the wombs? Attaqu Allah alladhi tasa'aluna bihi al-ara. Um... No, it doesn't say the womb. It says yes, the, it does. No, it does. Read it. Wa al arhama. That's al connecting it back. Yes. Wa means that you are to fear your Lord and the wombs. It gives you an explanatory note about who your Lord is and what He's done, and then it says and the womb. So yes, it does grammatically. So Manu, again, answer the question, please. How do you fear Allah and the wombs? The actual word for al arham means those who are of kinship or very close relatives. The literal translation is wombs. Now you're explaining what the word means. If you want to go to explanation, then we're going to go to commentaries and give you an explanation for Surah 328, which you disregarded. It doesn't say the kinships. It says wombs. It's wombs, plural. Okay. Yes, I know what it means. 
I know what that means. But how did you know that's the meaning of the term without consulting the commentaries? Again, this is what you're doing. When it's convenient, you ignore the commentaries, but when it suits your purpose, then you'll consult them to explain passages that apart from them are unclear. So again, Manu, I, what does it mean to fear Allah? Same word, uses Surah 328, and the wombs. How do you fear Allah in the wombs? If, if, the, word, if the word means two things in, in that language, meaning it also means wombs and it means you're close Somebody as close as the, okay. you know, your. How do you fear them? That's my question. That's still not answering my question. How do you fear those kins, relatives established by the womb? How do you fear them? Put a barrier between so you and them? There, there is the word in Arabic, I'm, what I'm trying, the examples I gave you. First, the word an and the word in in Arabic are not the same, those two words. So one cannot be if and cannot be that which. And the, another example I gave you is the, the word, the, the person who has taqwa, they become mutaqoon, yeah. it doesn't fully capture, fear of God doesn't fully capture. It's, a, it's almost, if you talk to the Arab, yeah. they say it's Manu, superior. for the sake of time, Manu, you're still not answering my question. Uh, my argument wasn't based on, on whether it's and or in. My argument's based on uh, the word taqwa. What does it mean in respect to your kin. You're telling me that it doesn't capture what it means in relation to Allah. That's not what I asked you. What does it mean in respect to your kin? How do you fear your kin? For the sake of time, I know you need to answer the question, please. Uh, it might be a complex issue. I, I mean, okay, I, it's complex. Probably, I, I might have to tell you about the fact that it's the same, it's the same view that the Quran says, you know, be, uh, be on guard of your, of your women and your children and so forth. And so protect so yourself from your women and your children. So protect yourself from your kin. That's exactly the opposite meaning of chapter 4 verse 1. That's not what it means. The commentators say you're wrong, who know the Arabic just as well, if not better than you. So your point is moot. The fact is chapter 3 verse 28 says what it says. If you're leaving in a situation in which you are numbered by the kufar, you can pretend to be friends in order to protect yourself and your interests because that's what the Quran says. But that's chapter 3, verse 28. We're about to look at chapter 5, verse 51, which doesn't have that exception clause. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, you're again told, O oh, you who believe, do not take Jews and Christians as awliya. No exception clause. And if you take them as awliya, you are no better than them. So my question is to you, Manu, in chapter 5, verse 51, you have the same thing stated. Disbelievers, Jews or Christians, are not your friends. The only time you befriend them is when you fear for your safety. The passage is clear as day. The, the way I understand it is that it, the, that portion of the verse in 328 doesn't even refer to any exception clauses. The exception clauses of God saying that have this, be mindful of this. And don't have any sort of a have have be mindful of that for a, for a lack of better translation. Be mindful and mind and mindful with the with the actual mindfulness. If if that's the best translation I can do for you, the word the word in Arabic. If you talk to the Arab, they say that's we've the, consulted that's the, the Arabic scholars. The word illa when it tells you illa and tattaqu minhum tuqatin. What does illa mean? Illa. You don't need to guess. La ilaha, hold on, let me give it to you. La ilaha illallah, right? Exception, exception or... So the exception is, you are not to befriend them except for this, for fear. So you're proving my point, Manu. So I don't know where we're going with this. Yeah, we do, we do, have, to, we do have to go to a break now. Uh, we can certainly talk more about this um, afterwards, but uh, I have ten translations in front of me, and they all agree with the way we're interpreting this passage and not with my news interpretation. All right, we have to go to a quick break. We'll be back in just a moment here on Jesus or Muhammad. Welcome back to Jesus or Muhammad. We have about a trillion callers on the line, so we're going to try to go through these quickly to, to get through a bunch of them. Um, so if we give you a, kind of a short answer, uh, sorry, but we are trying to get to as many people as possible. So uh, our next caller, Radical Moderate. You on the line? Hey guys, how you doing tonight? Hey, Great what's up, know? brother? What's up, man? Hey, I got a. Uh, actually, I got two questions. One for me. One, if you would um, like to answer through me as a proxy. 
But first, my question. I'm wondering if you guys could address uh, one of the common Muslim things in Where they Rado Kamadika, your phone is breaking up. Yeah, you're breaking we up. We can't brother. hear you. Oh, how's this? Is this better? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm wondering if you could address, like, for instance, uh, Muslims with Romans 3, where they say, see, Paul is a liar. You know, where Paul <laughs> says, you know, what, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. You, you, you want to take that, Dave, or you want me to take what you Go want? Go ahead. Uh, just just uh, short, short Okay, version. Romans chapter uh, 3. By, by the way, you said you had two questions. What was the other one? And then we'll try to hit them both. Uh, the other one is from a Muslim who is too shy to call, so he's using me as a proxy. Okay. Um, it's a question. Um, how about you ask David if he is willing to apologize for I can hope on that very chance? Uh, we can't hear you, uh, yeah, radical. Yeah, you're so. breaking up, buddy. Can't hear you, man. Uh, try one more time. Try one more time, and then if it doesn't work, we'll we'll go on to answer this one. Okay. Um, the question is from the Muslim regarding fine. If you can provide a source, or if you can't, then will you apologize? Uh, no, actually, tell your Muslim source. And again, maybe next time, when a Muslim tells you to be his proxy, just kindly deny. Let the Muslim call in. I have actually a massive Arabic file that quote, provides quotations that thawing was something Muhammad did do, and it's a filthy practice. We're going to get a translator. When we do, he's going to have to call on the air and apologize and recant for being a Muhammadan. Matter of fact, uh, we, we're, we're coming back for some shows next month. M might we be able to address we'll try some of to this? Get, no, actually, what we'll try to do is get him translated. I have a massive file because Muslims were in an uproar because of some fatwas that said that Muhammad thawed Aisha. Mm -hmm. If I were to describe what it is, it's filthy, it's repulsive, you'll throw up. Mm -hmm. So they try to go to the source say, these are four sources, they're not reliable. Well, glory to God, I have a good brother who actually found multiple sources from multiple people confirming the reliability of that incident. And I have it right here on email, just waiting for it to be translated. I challenge that Muslim friend of yours, say if he has the courage, I'll send him the file, let him translate it, post it on his website. And if he does, I will say he's not ashamed of Muhammad. Will he take me up on the challenge? If not, he better apologize for being a Muhammadan and following a man who would thigh a six-year-old. All right. Now, Sam, was Paul a liar? Did Paul yeah. advocate lying? Well, I think the Muslims are confusing, and no disrespect intended, but it's the truth. The Muslims are confusing Paul with Muhammad mm -hmm. and his God, Allah, because Allah said he's the greatest deceiver of them all, mm -hmm. and Muhammad condoned lying. Uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 7 to 8 is often misquoted to make Paul say something he did not say. Let me read the context so you understand what Paul is trying to Wait, say. First, first read it like a Muslim will quote it, and then read the context. Okay. Uh, well, let me just read it and see how, how they explain it. Someone may, uh, my arg might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness, so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? So they stop there. See, you know what he's saying, Paul? If my lying will bring God glory, so then why am I being punished as a sinner? So let me just go on lying, because it's going to glorify God anyway. That doesn't sound like Paul. You know, you know what's shameful about that? The very next verse, Paul says that those people who accuse me of this, they are worthy to be condemned. Now let's read the verse for, next verse, and it seems like Paul, by inspiration, had people like these Muslims in mind who slandered and lied about him. Notice verse 8. Why not, why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say? Slanderously. They're slandering Paul by saying these things. We don't teach this, but some liars are saying we do. Why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result? Their condemnation is just. You who lie and twist the words of this blessed apostle, Paul says you deserve to be condemned, righteous, uh, rightly so. Now there are verses where Paul clearly says he doesn't use deception. I don't know if I have time to look at two of them. No. Uh, hmm? uh, <laughs> how, about, how about one real quick? We have like okay. a, a bunch of colors. Second Corinthians 4 verse 2. Rather we have renounced secret and shameful ways. Second Corinthians 4 2. We do not use deception. So Paul wasn't a follower of Allah or Muhammad. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Second so Corinthians 4, Paul. verse 2. So you have Paul, who condemns the use of deception. Condemns Allah and Muhammad. Who quotes people as accusing him of using deception, and then says that they are justly condemned. The Muslims ignore that part, ignore everything else he said, rip the little passage out of context, and then accuse us of doing what their prophet did, namely using deception. Exactly. And then they condemn Paul for it. Exactly. Shameful. Shameful, my friends. All right, next we have Andy on the line. 
Andy, can you hear us? Hello. Hello, Andy? Yes, can you hear me, guys? Yes, we can. Hey, what's up? How are you? Yeah, Good. Uh, peace, be with you. peace be with you guys in the, in the name of our Jesus Lord. Jesus All right. Amen. Christ. Thank you. I, I, um, I, before I, before I, uh, um, I, I'll make my comment, may I say just a, a two sentences to Manu? Sure. Sure, go ahead. Just keep it quick. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Manu, I, uh, I think there is a reason why you call this program, although I know that it probably uh, it's not about conversion. You're not trying to convert David and Sam <laughs> to Islam. But I know there is a reason for it, and I just want you to know that I am praying for you, and I've been praying for you for weeks, that you will, that you will find the true Messiah, the true God, Jesus Christ. And here is, uh, here is my comment. Uh, actually, my comment is uh, for, um, for uh, the, uh, regarding the prophet, uh, the, regarding the um, Muhammad being a true prophet. Um, I'm, I'm really shocked and surprised that Muslims um, do put, put this guy higher than Jesus, he, although even though uh, Jesus performed mir miracles, healed Sick and, and 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 even gave life, but my but what's really surprising to me is that he's not even close when it, when it, when it comes to prophecies. I, I don't think he even gave any prophecies when we compare Muhammad to biblical uh, prophets. But what strikes me is um, in the book of Exodus um, when Moses. Uh, I, I I remember. When I was reading the book of Exodus, that uh, the priests of Pharaoh were could even they could even perform miracles because they could um, they what they did with the stick of Moses they turned it into snakes. Am I correct? Yes, the uh, the magicians could perform some miracles. They couldn't do everything Moses could do, but because of the magic arts, they could do some of it. Exactly. So correct. So. My, my, uh, what I wanted to point out is that even they could perform some miracles where Muhammad could not. So it's just a comment. But thank you, thank you guys for your time. All right, brother, thank you. And uh, yes, it is very interesting that uh, Muhammad, uh, according to the Quran, could perform no miracles other than uh, reciting verses. And, and just for those of you out there, because I know that, that some Muslims really regard this uh, as miraculous. I mean, suppose that uh, CL here claimed that he's such a great rapper. Uh, he's such a great rapper, his rhymes must be inspired by God. Would you, wouldn't you think that that's the most ridiculous argument ever offered by anyone uh, to claim that he's a prophet? And ladies and gentlemen, that's what Muhammad did. He offered the 7th century version of that. My poetry is better than your poetry. That's my miracle, and therefore my poetry is the inspired word of God because I just beat you. <laughs> and it's didn't, this didn't impress many people. Uh, the, the Meccans, some of the Meccans actually responded and would refute him and write verses that are just as good. Uh, one of his scribes, we talked about the other day, uh, one of his scribes could even write uh, better than Muhammad was actually. Muhammad recites oh, yeah, something yeah. and then Abdullah, Abdullah, Abdullah Saad, would write something and Muhammad would say, yeah, that's actually better. Uh, Isn't he very... the one who had uh, Jibril go with him? That's Hassan ibn Thabit. There was a poet, another. And by the way, Lord Jesus willing, in future shows we'll discuss all this. We should do a show uh, if, if next time we're here, Lord willing, on whether the Quran is miraculous and what did Muhammad's contemporaries think. Uh, there are hadiths that talk about Hassan ibn Thabit, a poet. Muhammad, and this is found in Bukhari, Muslim, by the way. Muhammad would encourage Hassan to lampoon, to mock Muhammad's opponents in poetry. Notice the inconsistency. When people did it to Muhammad, he murdered them. Mm -hmm. But when Muhammad's companions do it to others, he praised them. And he says, Hassan, lampoon them, for the Holy Spirit is with you. Another narration says, lampoon them, Hassan, because Gabriel is with you. In other words, Gabriel and the Holy Spirit are assisting you to write poetry mocking and ridiculing my opponents. Go ahead! More power to you. But wait, isn't that a claim to inspiration? Mm -hmm. Is Muhammad saying that Hassan is being inspired by the Holy Spirit and Gabriel to write poetry to mock the enemies of Muhammad? Mm -hmm. If so, then how different is his poetry from the Quran? I don't know. Yeah. Strange argument, though. Very strange. Regardless. Yeah. Uh, all right, next we have Vincent on the line. Vincent, can you hear us? Vincent, are you there? Yes, I'm here. 
Hey, hey Vincent, how are you? I'm good, thank you. And um, it is really good to hear you. Um, I'm from Canada, and um, basically, we have been, uh, me and my wife, we have been listening to you since last year. So I'm a first-time first, first -time caller. Praise the Lord. All right, brother, what do you have for us? Y yes, thank you. Um, Recent, you know, um, being from Pakistan, I, I was born and raised in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we have seen that the Sharia law, which we often hear, and even we hear in Canada and we hear in states, uh, that it is, it is good for all humanity. And that's what we hear from Muslims. Well, it's fantastic and, for humanity. But hey, Muhammad time, is a mercy for all mankind. Come on, yeah. At the same time, what I hear, what I see is, that in most of the Muslim countries, Christians and other minorities are persecuted regularly. Exactly. Now, recent, in, in Pakistan, uh, there's a law which is called blasphemy law. And it is taking lives of the Christians every so often, almost every week now we hear somebody is uh, being put in jail and is charged, and even without uh, seeing that they're having their day in court, they are being uh, uh, assassinated. So what my question is, that how does, uh, if for, for everybody and in our information, how does the Islamic law or Sharia justify persecuting or killing actually uh, those who blaspheme Muhammad? What was the question? Um, uh, how does Islam justify killing those who blaspheme Muhammad? And just, just as yes, a, as, as, yes, as a, Christians and non-Muslims. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, uh, well, first of all, as as we point out regularly on this program, Muslims are commanded to fight and subjugate unbelievers. This comes from Surah 9, verse 29. You'll want to learn it. You'll want to memorize it. Uh, it reads, "Fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and His Messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, so Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. If Muslims are in power, then Christians and Jews must be subjugated. Everyone else has to convert to Islam or be killed. Now, you asked something specific, those who criticize Muhammad. And it's interesting, you have this, uh, you have this from the earliest Muslim sources. Sam, did you want to comment, or should I go into some? Well, I mean... Basically, Muhammad is on the level of Allah. Mm -hmm. You cannot be a Muslim if you don't submit to Muhammad as much as you do to Allah. So then to insult Muhammad, whom the Muslim sources say was Habib Allah, the beloved of Allah, means death. I mean, that's their logic. He's the greatest man who ever lived. He's a mercy unto mankind. He's the one that Allah sent to perfect the religion, the deen of the prophets before him. Allah loves him more than any creature. In fact, there's a narration where Allah supposedly tells Adam, had it not been for, um, for Muhammad, I would not have created you, Adam. So when you have a figure that's, that's so highly exalted that he's actually deified and placed on the level of Allah, it only makes sense that to insult him invites death mm -hmm. from their mindset, from their perspective. And don't you have, in the earliest Muslim sources, don't you have uh, examples of this? Let me oh, go yeah. ahead and, let sure. me go ahead and uh, uh, read one or two. Um, Sunan Abu Dawood, so one of Islam's most trusted authoritative collections of ahadith, uh, uh, number 4349, a Jewess used to abuse the prophet and disparage him, so she's making fun of him. A man strangled her till she died. The apostle mm. of Allah declared that no recompense was payable for her blood. So no payment, no punishment for this man who killed a woman for making fun of Muhammad. That's a very uh, short, very sad passage. If you read the passage before it in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4348, You'll read about a man who uh, had a slave girl. He had children through this slave girl, but she did not convert to Islam while he did, and he, she used to make fun of Muhammad. He killed her for this, and the blood spilled between her legs on, her, on, on one of her children. So you have these sorts of horrible uh, stories in Islam's most trusted uh, collections. You also have Abu Bakr, when one of his followers said, hey, someone's making fun of you. Should I kill him? Abu Bakr said, no, that's only what you do for Muhammad. So according to Abu Bakr in Sahih Sitta, uh, if someone criticizes Muhammad, the penalty is death. And this is what you see from people like Abu Afaq uh, and Asma bint Marwan, who are criticizing Muhammad or criticizing the Muslim community and would be murdered for it. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Do you have any more calls or did you want to comment, Brother Seal? 
Well, um, just to comment on that, <clears throat> you know, one of the biggest forms of blasphemy is to renounce Islam and yeah. to leave Islam, whether you just become an atheist or you become a Christian or whatever. And I think everyone at this point knows that the penalty for leaving Islam and apostating is death, is to be executed. Exactly. So um, there you have it right there. This is, there's no doubt about it. You cannot mock Allah, you cannot mock the Muhammad or the Quran. If a Muslim just jokes and says a joke in mockery of Islam or any aspect of Islam, he automatically becomes a kafir. And if you become a kafir, then you're liable for death. Exactly. Your blood is then shed without impunity. Exactly. Yeah, so, uh, brother, you're absolutely correct. Yes, you, you do have laws like this in Pakistan. These laws are horribly abused and misused, but tragically they do go back to Muhammad himself. And so viewers out there from around the world, when you look to what's going on in Pakistan and see Muslims accusing unbelievers of blasphemy and then being tossed in prison or being murdered and you're repulsed by this teaching, uh, that's exactly what you'll find in the teachings of Muhammad. And don't let any Muslim tell you otherwise. If a Muslim wants to say otherwise, you invite him to call in and we'll be yeah. happy to straighten him out. Yeah. That's that's well, there, maybe it's just they misunderstand Islam. You know, I know these are majority Muslim countries, and they've been practicing Islam for, what, 1,400 years. Mm -hmm. Maybe they just don't understand it. Yeah, exactly. The way that's Muslims a good here in America do. Yeah, of course. That makes perfect yeah. sense. Yeah. The Muslim, <laughs> did, did you get that? That was a, that was a bit of sarcasm. It's yeah. fu it, it, the point is, it's funny to have westernized uh, Muslims who grow up in the United States with Western values telling Muslim countries where everyone grows up in the mosque under the, under the, under the tutelage of their sheikhs. Uh, you guys don't know how to do Islam, even though obviously yeah. they're following the commands of Muhammad. All right, we have to go on to some more callers. I think next we have Pastor Sam on the line. Pastor Sam. Pastor Sam, are you there? All right. I guess I am there. Okay, turn okay, off yeah. your TV. Could you, could you, brother, could you turn down your uh, television? We hear it in the background. So listen through your phone and not through your television. Yeah, definitely. Okay, hey, what How do you are have you, for sir? us? Can you hear my voice now? Yes, of course. Can. Okay, hello, my dear, dear bro, all the brothers in Christ. Amen. Hello, brother. His name. Uh, my name is Sam Nadra, as you mentioned. Uh, uh, Pastor of Church, Mohabba Church from Toronto. I'm so glad to see you. But also, I just want to ask you, where is Pastor Joseph? Pastor Joseph? He's yes. somewhere. Where? Somewhere. Yeah, I'd like to, to, to see him, too, because he's really uh, bring the more blessing to us. But it doesn't mean that you are not blessed. No, we know what you meant. We're not a blessing. We caught you, Pastor Sam. It's okay. <laughs> we still love you. What's your question, yeah. Pastor Sam? Because we got yeah, callers. What's your my, question? Yeah, my question is uh, my background is Muslim background. Praise the Lord Jesus, he saved you out of the darkness and brought you into his light. Yes, but Muslim background, 21 years ago I converted to the Christ. Amen. Yeah, Amen. And also, I want to say, that when you mention about the Jesus or Muhammad, obviously cannot be comparable because God has created us according to his will. And also, how can, how can shame or the human to compare the Jesus to the human. Jesus does not have a, a spiritual, a physically father. And this is the one of the points. And the other point, Holy Spirit reveals to yourself who is the God. It means you, first of all, um, he who is really debating right now, first of all, God wants us since their heart, pure heart. And if you know the truth, through shall set you free. Easily. Yes, he, uh, for example, 21 years ago, I asked God, God, show yourself to me. I don't want to be uh, praised as an idol. I don't want to be like an instrument for you. I want to have a really relationship with you. When I am under, when I'm praying namaz, Lord, why don't you somehow come and show us some sign to me or show me? And I'd like to have a relationship with you. First question I ask. Second question, I ask God, show me the right way to come to you. The third question, I ask God, where are you? And I want to, I want to see the right person, 
and grab that person's hand and come to you. It doesn't, what does it mean? It means I am looking to, and through shall set me free. And the Jesus came to my heart 21 years ago. Now I'm talking about, we are talking, the, something is infinity. Human mind, even if you are philosophy, even if you know all the religion, everything, again, according to the God knowledge, you are limited. You cannot get yourself unlimited. Jesus unlimited. Why? Because that's doesn't happen physically, Father. God came as flesh and presumed his characteristic to us. What does it mean, the characteristic? It means, this. for example, you ask, God, are you, you are the, full of love. You are humble. You are, you have a patience. But these are, this before was as an adjective for me. But he showed his love to me. He showed his passion to me. And I, right now, I know God through the Jesus relationship. Before I know God, now I have a relationship. How can many people that they, they, they are debating to the to the to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the Jesus? And another point: when I converted from the Islam to the Christian 21 years ago, my family told me, "Shame on you!" and curse to me. Why I'm changing? But you know what I answered? Have you read the Quran? Have you read the Quran? Please read the Quran carefully, then come and curse to me. You don't, if you don't read the Quran, then why you curse to me? You just compare in Quran. Compare the, all the, all the, all the people about the Muhammad and also the Quran. Obviously, you will uh, brother, brother, Pastor Sam, brother Sam, your Pastor phone Sam, is breaking up. Your but phone is breaking yeah, up. can you wind it down? Rest. We have other callers. Can you make it real quick, less than yeah. a minute? Because we got to go other callers. Your phone's breaking yeah, down. Yeah, see if your phone is working. Yeah, the, my point is this. The point is we cannot debate. Only Jesus is infinity. Jesus is Lord and cannot compare to the human. Okay. Well, thank you for your comments. The Lord Jesus bless you and watch over you and seal you by His Spirit for all eternity. Uh, just one thing, real quickly, I'd like to say. Uh, if he means you can't debate in the sense that you can't convert or convince anyone to become a believer through debating, I whole, wholeheartedly agree it has to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. With that said, it's the same Holy Spirit in the scriptures that he produced that says he will use debates and apologetics to bring people to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And there's a plethora of passages that say that. One that comes to mind, 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 15. Mm -hmm. There's many, but for the sake of time, because we have callers, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And this is inspired by the Holy Spirit through Peter to exhort all Christians to do the following. But in your hearts, always set apart Christ as Lord. <clears throat> but in your hearts, um, set apart Christ as Lord. Always set him apart as Lord in your hearts. <clears throat> always being prepared to give a defense or an answer for the hope that is within you to whomever asks. Yet do so with gentleness and reverence. So 1 Peter 3.15 exhorts all true Christians to be ready to defend, ready, able, and willing in the power of the Holy Spirit to defend and refute all objections against why you've set apart Jesus Christ as Lord in your heart. And in Jesus' name, we will carry out that commission faithfully by His grace and mercy. All right. Uh, thank you. And I think we have a caller from Lebanon. So we want to get to you right now. Uh, we have a caller from Lebanon? Yes, yes, this is Banderini here. Hey, how's it going? Pretty, pretty good, pretty good. Am I, am I on the air again here? Yes, you yes, are. my friend, how are you? Yeah, I called about a couple of days to ask you guys a question, but yes. uh, I was listening earlier to David, and he was saying uh, about the Quran, how it talks about uh, killing the Muslims, but I don't know what you guys say about the Bible. It says in the book of Luke, chapter 19, verse 27. Uh, uh, be serious. That's what it says. Uh, what's uh, your name again? Can you hear me? Yeah, what's your name? Benderini. Benderini, uh, I'm going to say, you're, you're not serious, right? I, I think you're joking when you quote Luke 19, 27. Have you read 11 to 26, or you just pulled 27 out of context? Have you read verses 11, 26, yes or no? No, no, I, I, I've, ben, read, I've read the whole Bible. I'll okay, hold on, right well, well, hold on, okay, 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 now, okay. Now tell here. me what's the context. Before we, yeah. without turning to your Bible, you read the whole Bible, right? What's the context of Luke 19:27? if you've read it, 11 to 26? It's pretty clear to me after I read the verse. It 
says pretty clear. That okay, here's my responding. question again. Here's my question you're not answering. What's the context of 27? 11 to 26, what is it talking about? We have the context here, but I'm going to call you out. You said you read the Bible. I'm going to say, brother, either you're doing taqiyya on me, concealment, or you have read it, you know the context, and you're ashamed to admit it because it's going to refute you. What's the context of 27? What is it about? It's about Jesus uh, telling, telling the people to slay them before me. Oh, okay. Okay, okay now okay, we're going okay, to okay, correct okay. you. Do yes. you want to correct them? Go ahead. Uh, you go ahead and correct them, and then we'll <laughs> compare that with what the Quran okay. says. So right. go ahead and jump in there. Do you no, see, we'll this get... is what Muslims do. And again, it upsets me they do this to our sacred scriptures because I, as a Christian, and I try to do this, I may not always do it perfectly because I'm imperfect. I always try to cite the Quran and Hadiths in context and accurately. He read one verse out of context because he didn't read the entire chapter, which exposes him and refutes his distortion of Scripture. Let me, can I read the context? Go ahead. 11 go ahead. to 27. We need, it. we need it. I want all the Christians to witness what Muslims do to our Scriptures because, again, as Muslims, they think they shouldn't respect our book because it's corrupted, even though his prophet said to respect my book. But anyway, let me hey, read Sam, it. Sam, Sam, could you just quote the one verse so you see okay, what happens if exactly. someone rips something out of context? Yeah. Quote the one verse and then say, and Jesus said this, and see what happens when then you include the Here's the, the context. verse that he wanted us to read, but he was scared to read the verses before it, which exposes him. Here it is, 27. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, Bring them here and kill them in front of me. See, there that's it. it. I Jesus see. Jesus said it. Jesus, Jesus is like said, Muhammad. Bring my enemies before me and kill me. So Christians, the implication is, Jesus is commanding Christians to bring his enemies before him and slay them. We are commanded so like to Muhammad. kill the unbelievers in the same way that Muhammad commanded his followers yes. to kill unbelievers. The sad fact is, what happens when you actually read the verse in yes. context? And, and God forbid, Jesus is not like Muhammad. He is Muhammad's God, master, lord, and judge. Let me read 11.26. Now let's see the context. While they were listening to, to this, he went on to tell them a parable. It's a parable. Jesus is telling a story, a my friends. A parable. Because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. I come back, right? <clears throat> but his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. This first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. <clears throat> then another servant came and said, Sir, here's your mina." I've kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I come back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, Take his minna away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Now, pay attention. Those standing by, he says, take his minna away, give it to the one who has ten. Sir, they said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they, they have will be taken away. Now, verse 27. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Do you want to explain what the parable is, Dave, or do you want me to do it? So, uh, look what happens when you include the context. Muslims quote just the part about slaying the enemies, and they say, and Jesus said that. When you go just a few verses earlier, you find that Jesus is telling a story about a king. This king goes away. He leaves his servants with some, with some, uh, some uh, gold and so on, some, some things. It can be all kinds of things. But he leaves his servants there to take care of things. He comes back, and he starts rewarding them. And the, there were certain people, there were people who didn't want him to come back and be king, and he says, slay them, according to this story. Muslims ignore all of the context, and they say, Jesus commands Christians to kill 
his enemies. How despicable can you be right. in, your, in your methodology? I, th I mean, normally, normally I would say uh, to a Muslim who uses this, uh, I'm sure you just got this off some horrible Muslim website and um, try to do a little more investigation next time. But this Muslim claims that he's, he's read, read the, the entire Bible. Bible. So yeah. he mm -hmm. knew that in context, Jesus is telling a story. I mean, it's like me. Suppose I say, Muhammad came to his followers and he said... Fight those who do not believe in Allah. And you just take it when I said, fight those who do not believe in Allah. And you say, David teaches people to fight those who believe in Allah. No, I didn't. I was telling a story about Muhammad. Here, Jesus is telling a story about a king. The king in this story says, slay, his, um, slay the unbelievers. And here you have a Muslim comes in, rips it out of context, doesn't give the context, and says, you Christians are as bad as the Muslims. Precisely. You believe in fighting the unbelievers, too. And, and what's ironic about that, Dave? Uh, Jesus is actually using this parable to talk about the fact he's going to go to heaven and will return eventually. Mm -hmm. That means until Jesus' return, we servants have no business killing those who rejected him. Mm -hmm. You understand the implication, Christians? The parable is saying that Jesus is that man who will go to a faraway country to receive a kingdom and will return at a later date. In the meantime, we servants are supposed to busy ourselves multiplying the talents that God gave us, not killing the subjects who told them, we don't want you as king over us. Do you know why? Because when Jesus returns, he will tell his servants, meaning the angels, gather those who didn't want me to be king and then punish them. Kill them by the sword. That's not how the angels will kill or destroy the disbelievers. You know how I know that? Go to Matthew 13, verses 37 to 43. Matthew 13, verses 37 to 43. There Jesus talks about him being the son of man coming with the angels and he'll send the angels to gather all the wicked and throw them in the fiery furnace. So the sword here is not literal. It's simply a parabolic way of saying that when he comes, his angels will take those who did not want him to be king and throw them in hell. But notice during that time, what does it assume? You as a servant have no right to kill those who do not want him to be king Busy yourself with multiplying the talents he gave you, because when he comes, he will judge. And for the life of me, I don't understand why a Muslim would want to use this to try to defend jihad now. That Muslims are commanded to take the sword, kill people, rape women, enslave their children now. Because you Muslims believe in a day of judgment in which Allah will punish disbelievers in hell. We too, and this is what it's referring to. So again, if this passage is going to prove anything, proving too much, you just condemn Allah for having a day of judgment in which he'll send people to hell. Because that's the point of Jesus when you read his words in context. And what, I'm, what, I'm, what I mean by context, the overall context of the Gospels and the New Testament as a whole. And here's what you have. Muslims are embarrassed about the teachings of Muhammad. And Precisely. so they want to show that everyone believes in those sort of violent teachings. But in order to try and maintain that, they have to rip our passages out of context and totally distort the meaning and ignore the clear teachings of the Bible. You know what Jesus said? We're to do with our enemies? Let me read it for you. Let me read you Jesus' clear words where Jesus is actually speaking, not telling a story about a king, and Muslims rip it out of context. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 45. Exactly. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So he's saying you've heard that, like in Islam, you're supposed to hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. God loves everyone, so you Christians must love everyone. Compare that with what you find in Islam. Read the Quran, Surah 3, verse 32. Allah does not love the unbelievers. See, our God loves everyone, and so we're commanded to love everyone. In Islam, Allah has no love for unbelievers, and so why should his followers care at all about killing them? And so what you're commanded in Islam, and we're not ripping any of this out of context. You had, the, the Muslim who called in had to rip a verse out of context, totally distort the meaning in order to suggest that Christianity promotes violence. Here are a couple of very brief verses you might want to check out to see exactly what Islam teaches. Read them in context. Read all of Surah 9 and read a couple of extra passages. Again, Surah 929, fight those who do not believe in Allah. Not fight those who attack you first. Not fight those who come after you. Fight those who do not believe in Allah. You have Surah 973, O oh, prophet, strive hard against who? Those who attack you first? No. Strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites and be unyielding to them. Never yield. 
Never, never give in. Never seek compromise. Surah 9, verse 111. For those of you Muslims who are out there thinking, ah, oh, but fight can mean all kinds of things. Maybe it means something else by fighting. What does the Quran say? The Quran in Surah 9 defines what it means by fighting. Surely Allah has bought of the believers their persons and their property for this, that they shall have the garden. They fight in Allah's way. Here you have the definition of fighting. They fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. Fighting in context of Surah 929, which you're commanded to do towards unbelievers, involves slaying them until you get slain. Surah 9, verse 123. Oh, you who believe. Are you a believer? You a believer in Islam? Here's what the Quran commands you. You who believe, fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardness. Surah 47, verse 35. Be not weary and faint-hearted, crying for peace. As a Muslim, you're not supposed to seek peace if you're in a position of power. Be not weary and faint-hearted, crying for peace when you should be uppermost, when you're in a position of power, when you should be uppermost. So you are not to seek peace as a Muslim if you're in a position to become dominant. And finally, Surah 48, verse 29, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those who are with him are severe against who? Against oppressors? No. Severe against disbelievers. And merciful among who? Merciful towards everyone? No. Merciful among themselves. That's what the Quran commands. Muhammad said in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, that he has been commanded to fight people until they say, La ilaha illallah, there is no God but Allah. You don't say that? Muslims are told to fight you. Uh, how can you compare this to Jesus commanding his followers to love and pray for everyone, even those who persecute you? There is no comparison here. And don't insult our intelligence by ripping verses out of context in order to show otherwise. All right, we have, uh, do we still have Melanie on the line? Melanie? Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, yes, we hear you. Hi. Hi, how you doing? Guys. How are you? Good, good. I'm so glad that I got, um, that I'm like right after Benderini. I was actually the person that asked him to call, and I pray to God that God moves him and saves him. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do too. What do you have for us? You have a question or comment? She's crying. Oh. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. I need to ask a question um, about Shahid and blood atonement. Um, I heard, I don't know if this is in a, in a hadith, I think it's a hadith, that says that uh, a, a Shahid can intercede for 70 family members with his blood um, to go to heaven. And I'm wondering if this is a true belief in Islam, why can't they accept the blood atonement of Jesus who intercedes for humanity um, for, for all that believe in him? I was wondering if Sam could um, go into detail about this. And if you could please also quote the Old Testament um, where Moses you know, gives the law of blood, of blood atonement and how it's fulfilled in the New Testament, because I've... I've noticed that when I speak to Muslims, they don't know the difference between um, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and they usually just mix up everything all together, and they get a little bit confused. Mm -hmm. right. So um, if, if Sam could please explain it, I would really appreciate it, and God bless uh, you guys. One second. And, uh, so, um, God bless you, uh, Lord bless you, Melanie. Yeah, yes, God, God bless you, sister. Un unfortunately, we only have about four or five minutes left on the program. So, but, but we'll tell you this, uh, we, we promise we'll have a, a program on this. We'll do, we'll do an entire show. If, if, uh, if you, if you want to hear about uh, atonement and what Islam teaches and blood atonement and uh, atonement in the Bible, uh, that, that's a topic for an entire show. We have tons of material on this. Uh, so, matter of fact, uh, unless something strange happens, another massive terrorist attack that we have to, uh, you know, address when we come back, we'll do that next month. Uh, when we have uh, when we have a few episodes, but Sam, did you want to touch on just it? give uh, two briefly? verses? She said she just wanted verses from the Old Testament, New Testament about the necessity of blood atonement mm -hmm. for forgiveness of sin. Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 to 14. Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 to 14. For the sake of time, I'll just read verse 11. Um, <clears throat> for the life of a creature is in the blood, and I've given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Leviticus 17.11, 10 to 14 for the context, and Hebrews 9.22. Uh, Hebrews 9.22 says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That's Hebrews 9.22. So 
Old Testament, New Testament perfectly agree. The blood is what cleanses you of sin when you believe and repent and turn towards God. And isn't it true that, because she asked about Islam as well, uh, just as kind of an overview, that uh, according to Sahih Muslim, according to Sahih Muslim, Muhammad said that uh, your sins, when you enter paradise, Muslims, your sins will be placed on Jews, Jews and, Christians. and Christians. If yeah. you don't believe us, go ahead. Sahih Muslim, one of your most trusted collections. Sahih Muslim, number 6666, Allah's <laughs> apostle said, no Muslim would die, but Allah would admit in his stead a Jew or a Christian in hellfire. And 6668, Allah's messenger said, there would come people amongst the Muslims on the day of resurrection with as heavy sins as a mountain. These are going to be some horrible, horrible sinners among the Muslims, according to this passage. There would come people among the Muslims with sins as heavy as a mountain, and Allah would forgive them, and he would place in their stead Jews and Christians. So you've got these people, and they have these massive sins, but Allah is going to send Jews and Christians to hell in their place, put their sins on the Jews and Christians. This is very interesting because this comes from Muhammad, not in one, but in multiple passages. And yet Muslims tell us all the time, it's so awful to think that Jesus would die on the cross for your sins. How can one man take the sins of another? It's impossible, except even according to Muhammad, that's what Allah is going to do. Very, very strange, odd teachings. Well, uh, shows come to an end. Uh, we, we, didn't get, we, had, we didn't actually get to go to uh, all of our videos we had on, on Keith Ellison and misrepresenting some passages. We'll have to look at those videos uh, sometime in the future. We ask everyone out there to, to think about what you've seen uh, this evening. According to Islam, you are allowed to be peaceful and friendly towards unbelievers only, only if you're in a minority, only if you're in a minority where those unbelievers are more powerful than you, then you pretend to be peaceful. You smile in their faces while cursing them in your hearts. But in Muslim majority countries, which our, uh, our brother from Pakistan pointed out, look at how Christians are treated in Muslim countries. Look at how Jews are treated in Muslim countries. Look at the countries that have significant minorities. Egypt has a significant uh, Christian minority. Uh, Iraq, there's a significant Christian minority. Pakistan, there's a significant Christian minority. Look at what happens to Christians in those areas. It's not Hey, let's all be friends, let's get along, and let's treat everyone as equals. It's, oh, you and I having a disagreement? Hey, he just blasphemed Muhammad, lock him up. And the person can't even defend himself because his testimony is practically worthless when compared with that of a Muslim. Why? Because of Muhammad's teachings. So this is what you have in the world. When you look at social injustice, uh, look at what happens in Muslim countries. Look at that and compare that with the West where we have been. We've had a strong Christian influence, a Judeo-Christian influence. Uh, think about those things. Until next time. Thank you for watching, Jesus or Muhammad.